Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. There's a priest in the Diocese of Oklahoma who is becoming a friend of mine. Um, His name is Everett Lees. We first met at a conference in the spring, and uh, since then we've we've spoken and emailed regularly about a variety of uh, different things. We're we're about the same age. We both have three kids. We share similar theological convictions. And and I also have to say, I I admire him. I admire Everett. Um, He's a good man. He's a good father. He's a great priest. Um, He really cares about um, both his church but also the the larger church, and he's willing to say what he thinks even if it's not popular. Um, So, a few months ago, he wrote an article which, you know, caused some conversation um, in the article, an article in the Living Church magazine, which is the biggest Episcopal publication, which is not saying much. Um, But still, he wrote this article calling on the national church to cut its spending on bureaucracy and hierarchy and, and focus its time and resources on the local church, uh, churches like, like ours where all of the work and the growth actually happens. And again, this article he wrote uh, caused a good deal of conversation. Um, Everett is courageous and smart, um, and I think it's fair to say he's become something of a leader, at least among the group of priests that I know. Well, a little less than three weeks ago, um, Everett was diagnosed with cancer. And on Tuesday night of this past week, just 15 days later, he died. He died. Now, I think it's fair to say that I've spent more time with dying people and their families than most. Um, I've probably done about 200 funerals over the course of my uh, priestly career. You know, earlier this week, my seven-year-old son, Marshall, overheard my wife and I talking about someone I was going to visit in the hospital. And he said, why is dad always visiting sick people? Why is everyone always dying, (laughs) you know, out of the mouths of babes? Um, I reminded him that no one gets out of here alive. Uh, We all die, and that part of my job was to sort of usher people from this life into the next, where they're going to meet Jesus face to face. So I'm, I want to say, you know, you never get used to death, Uh, but I've been around a lot of it. And yet, I will say, Everett's death hit me harder than most. Uh, First, because it was was so sudden. To be honest with you, I didn't even know that he had cancer until he died. I saw a couple Facebook posts of him in the hospital, um, one of which was praising his wife for just taking such good care of him, one which was thanking everyone for their prayers. But when I saw those posts, I, I figured it was appendicitis or a, a broken bone or something more, more common. Uh, but then all of a sudden, he was gone. And the speed of his death was a painful reminder that all of us are just one diagnosis or one accident away from a similar fate. Jesus uh, says a few times in the Gospels that the end will come like a thief in the night when we least expect it, so to be prepared. And my friend's sudden death is a a stark reminder to to keep short accounts with each other, with those you love, to be quick to say, I love you, or I'm sorry, or I forgive you, quick to give someone a hug or a call because you never uh, know when you might not have another chance. I think his death also affected me because we share so much in common. We're the same age and the same profession, same stage of life, same number of children. Uh, And the associate priest at his church uh, talked a little bit about just the difficulty of the past few weeks about visiting Everett in the hospital and Everett being positive and cracking jokes, and then suddenly he was gone and and having to be with his children at his bedside and to uh, respond to all the emotions that people are feeling. His associate said, you know, it's it's been difficult, but I'm taking it slow, hour by hour, minute by minute. Maybe you've been in a similar situation where all you could do was take it, you know, one day, maybe even one moment at a time. Now, generally speaking, I'll say I'm not often inclined to ask the why questions. You know, why God? Why did my friend have to die? 
Why now with a wife and three kids and a thriving church, you know, when you seem to be using Him in such a, a powerful way? You know, how, God, could this be your will? How could you let this happen? How could this possibly be for the best, for the best of His, his family, His church, for the best of your kingdom and the world? I think we all have our own ideas about the way the world is supposed to work, how our lives are supposed to go, how the story is supposed to end. We all have our own ideas about what's best for us and what's best for others. And Everett's death just, it doesn't fit into that story. There's a verse of the Bible that's been repeated often in season four of The Chosen, which I talk about from time to time, this, this television show, The Chosen, about the life of Jesus. And this particular verse comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 8. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. God doesn't operate according to our plans. And in today's reading from the Gospel of Mark, we, we hear about another person who has his own plans, has his own ideas about the way the world is supposed to work, how the story is supposed to go, how God is supposed to operate. Or we're told that Jesus went with His disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way He asked them, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, well, some say you're John the Baptist, come back to life, and others, Elijah, this Old Testament prophet, and still others, one of the other prophets. And then Jesus asks them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. And I have to say, at that precise moment, Peter must have been filled with such hope and joy, expectation, satisfaction that he'd gotten it right, he'd answered correctly, you are the Messiah. You know, all of his dreams are about to come true. The hope of, of generations of Jews who've been waiting for the Messiah to show up, and surely what's going to happen next is Jesus is going to raise up an army. He's already got a crowd with him. They're going to march on Jerusalem. They're going to defeat the Romans. They're going to return Israel to their, their rightful place as God's chosen and holy nation on earth. Surely Peter is thinking to himself, all of my dreams are coming true. All of my prayers have been answered. All of my problems are over. Surely this must be God's will, must be God's plan. And then Jesus tells them what His Messiahship is actually going to look like. He tells them what is going to happen next. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days rise again, he said all this quite openly. And Peter can't handle it. That can't be right. That can't be the plan. That, that can't be how the story ends. I mean, come on, Jesus. Everything is going so well. Everyone loves you. You're gathering all these people. How could you say that the Messiah, God's chosen, is going to be rejected? How could He possibly suffer and die? How could that be God's will? How could that be God's plan? And so Peter sort of takes Jesus aside, and the, Mark tells us he begins to rebuke Him you know, to talk some sense into him. But turning and looking at his disciples, the gospel says, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, Jesus says. You may have your own ideas about what's important, what matters, how life is supposed to be, how the story is supposed to end, but your plans are not my plans, Jesus says. They're not God's plans. 
And then Jesus calls the whole crowd to Himself and says quite famously, if any want to become My followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow Me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for My sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Now, if I had preached this passage last week, I might be tempted to talk about how Jesus calls His followers to be willing to put themselves in, in harm's way for His sake, to be willing to suffer and to even die for Him. And there's truth in that. You know, sometimes He does. Sometimes that is the call. Certainly it was for those first disciples, nearly all of whom lost their life because they wouldn't shut up about Jesus, who had died and risen again, who offered forgiveness of sins and eternal life for all those who put their trust in Him. But that would have been last week. And this morning, I want to say something a little bit different. What I want to say is that I think we have all been given crosses to bear. My guess is that for nearly everyone in this room, there's something that hurts, something that's confusing. There's some part of your life that isn't going according to plan. There's some way in which, like Peter, you want to take Jesus aside and rebuke Him, you know, speak some sense into Him, tell Him how He's wrong, tell Him how things are supposed to go, get Him and your life back on track. My hunch is that for most of us, there's, there's some pain or some fear, some aspect of our life that, that makes us think to ourselves, how can this be part of God's will? How can this possibly be part of His plan for my life? And yet, at least for now, it is. And I think that when Jesus calls us to take up our cross and follow Him, what He's asking us to do is to bear our sufferings with patience and to trust Him and to know that as hard as it is right now, it's not the end of the story. When Jesus talks about us losing our lives, He's calling us to give up on how we think our lives are supposed to go and to follow Him nonetheless, to trust that even in the midst of pain and confusion, He is with us and He's working all things together for our good and for the good of the world. Because that's the story of the cross, right? That's the Christian story, that the, the most unimaginably horrible thing that could ever happen, the death of God, becomes the instrument of our salvation the forgiveness of our sins, and the gate to eternal life. And so what Jesus is calling us to do, again, is to give up on our way, our plans, our sense of how the story is supposed to go, and to look to Him who lived and died and rose again and promises to be with us each and every moment of our lives until we see Him face to face in a place where there actually is no more pain or death or tears, but just joy and life forever. So as I wrap up this morning, I want to share with you the final words uh, from that email that Everett's kind of partner in crime, his associate, wrote. Here's what he said. Everett was a true disciple of Jesus Christ. He loved the Lord with all his heart and believed in the promises contained in the gospel. His faith was firm and rooted in our great high priest, which has comforted me. So today, I ask that we give to the fund for Everett's children, and more importantly, to pray for his family and his congregation. Praying is the best thing we can do. It has comforted me greatly. We will be okay. May Everett rest in peace and bask in the glory of God. Amen.